Therefore, it is time for question period. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thanks very much, Speaker. Uh, my question this morning is for the Premier. Research completed by the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers really shines a light on the mismanagement of Ontario's electricity system. They poured over data issued by the independent electricity system operator and the Ontario Energy Board, and what what was revealed was was wildly disappointing, Speaker. It showed the province exported electricity at a net financial loss of up to 1.25 billion with a B billion dollars. That's 1.25 billion dollars. Mr. Speaker, yes or no? Will the Premier confirm? Did the Liberal government lose almost 1.25 billion dollars exporting power? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the, um, let's look at the facts. The, uh, the fact is that all jurisdictions import and export electricity to the benefit of their ratepayers, Mr. Speaker. That's actually how the system works. Ontario is no different, and uh, with the IESO estimating that electricity exports reduce costs for Ontarians by hundreds of millions of dollars. Sounds to me I'm going to have to pick up where I left off, and I will. We enforce that, Mr. Speaker, that the ISO estimates that electricity exports reduce costs for Ontarians by hundreds of millions of dollars every year. So those are cost savings, Mr. Speaker. And this net benefit to Ontario was $236 million last year, Mr. Speaker. That's a net benefit to the people of Ontario because of taking part in uh, importing and exporting electricity to the benefit of their ratepayers, Mr. Speaker. On top of regular trade, we also pursue firm agreements wherever it makes sense to yes, ratepayers in the province, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Energy will want to speak more to this in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. So, Speaker, the government is saying that the experts, the engineers, are wrong and they know better. This liberal spin is ridiculous. It's like costing $20 to make a pizza, selling eight slices at a dollar a piece and saying you're making money. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. You're not making money. We just wanted the government to come clean here this morning and start to tell the truth on this. careful of how you word uh, making an accusation. Okay, so, so sure the government found an export partner, but OSPE's numbers here are staggering. The numbers from the engineers are stagger staggering. We're subsidizing power for Michigan and New York and other neighboring jurisdictions. And they're poaching our jobs to make matters worse because they're taking our electricity at a low cost. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier admit this government Question. lost over a billion dollars exporting power? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Very pleased to rise. The member from Renfrew and Nipissing Pembroke will come to order, and we're now in warnings. Thank you. You got what you asked for. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So it is important to note that today Ontario is a next net exporter of power. And in 2016, the net benefit, Mr. Speaker, of those exports to ratepayers was $236 million, as estimated by the independent system operator. These benefits translate into reduced costs for the ratepayer. Member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Finish. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And so since 2013, the net benefit of our exports has been over $1 billion, Mr. Wow. Speaker, in savings to Ontario ratepayers. Before, Mr. Speaker, back in the early 2000s, Ontario used to be an importer of electricity. And what was the result? That was when our system was uh, dependent on unreliable and expensive electricity from neighboring jurisdictions, Black often forcing us to overpay for electricity. Now, Mr. Speaker, we're making money, we're making sure we Thank that back into the system to keep cost down. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, this political spin is absurd. Yep. These numbers don't lie. They come from the engineers here in Ontario. In 2016, 
The province exported a total of 20, 21.9 terawatt hours of electricity at a net financial loss of more than $500 million. And most of this was clean, green energy spilling over the dams at Niagara Falls and other hydroelectric facilities across the province. The engineers noted that over the last few years, the total exports represent nearly enough electricity to power every home in Ontario for an entire year. That's the legacy of the mismanagement on the electricity file from the Liberal government. Mr. Speaker, how can this government continue to gouge electricity customers at the yes, same sir. time they're yes, exporting enough electricity at a loss to Thank power you. every home in the province? Yes, sir. So, Mr. Speaker, I know the uh, member opposite used the word legacy, so let's talk about their legacy when it comes to electricity. In 2002 and 2003, Ontario paid $900 million to import electricity. From 1996 to 2003, overall installed. The member from the Pean Carlton is warned. Carry on. Speaker, from 96 to 2003, overall uh, installed generation capacity fell 6 percent. That's like running Niagara Falls dry at the same time demand grew by 8 percent, Mr. Speaker. That's their legacy. Our legacy? Rebuilding a system, making it clean, making it reliable, and bring forward the Fair Hydro Plan that makes it affordable, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to make sure that Answer. we keep the best interests of Ontario ratepayers in hand, and they'll continue to misinform those ratepayers, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Better not make eye contact with me. The member will withdraw. I'll withdraw. No question. Same same member. Uh, thanks, uh, Speaker. And again, my questions for the Premier. The bad news stories on the electricity file come as fast as the water flows over Niagara Falls, Speaker. The Ontario PCs believe in green, clean, renewable power. What we don't believe in, what we don't believe in is selling it to Michigan and New York at a loss. Let's be a little more specific. We have great made in Ontario power hydroelectric. But last year, the Liberals allowed 4.7 terawatt hours of hydroelectric power to be wasted in Ontario, including the station at Niagara Falls. It's the equivalent of powering nearly 500,000 homes for a year. Mr. Uh, Speaker, how did the government mismanage the system so poorly that we're letting green hydroelectric power made in Ontario? to be shipped across the border at such a significant loss. Mr. Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So let's let's talk about what they're claiming, Mr. Speaker. They like to claim that power is wasted when water is spilled at hydroelectric generating stations, Mr. Speaker. This just shows how little they know about the system. Our advantage of our clean, reliable, and flexible system that we have built is that we're able to procure energy on an as-needed basis. This means that we only use the electricity that is produced at the cheapest cost at that time, Mr. Speaker. Any time, any time a generator is not producing electricity, it is because there were cheaper options available at that time. This means that a hydro facility will generate power when it can offer into the market at a low price, and it is not used when it offers too expensive power to any other sources. Mr. Speaker, which begs the question, do the PCs really think we should be running these generators at a higher cost to Ontario ratepayers? Probably so, Mr. Speaker. Maybe they'll do Thank that you. this weekend when they come up with maybe one idea Thank on you. policy. Supplementary. Speaker, Run you out of office. Well, what we really need to do here is take the cookie jar off that minister's desk because he's made a mockery of our electricity system in Ontario. It's made a complete mess of our Ontario electricity system. Minister of Education is warned. Speaker, to make matters worse, I just want to reiterate that Ontario exported 21.9 terawatt hours of electricity at a net financial loss of up to 1.25 
billion. That number represents more than 2 million homes worth of electricity that Ontario has sold to neighbouring jurisdictions for a price less than what it costs to produce. Mr. Speaker, what does the Premier say? What does the Minister say to those 2 million electricity customers in Ontario that have to overpay so you can subsidize power to our neighbouring jurisdictions that are poaching our jobs at the same time? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What do I say to all of the two million customers that he was talking about, Mr. Speaker? They voted against reducing their rates by 25 percent, Mr. Speaker. That's what I would say to them. They have no plan on actually helping them, Mr. Speaker, and we do. But when it comes to net benefits of the export system, Mr. Speaker, every jurisdiction imports and exports electricity. And we do so, Mr. Speaker, at the net benefit of $236 million in 2016. We did the same in 2015, the same in 2014, the same in 2013, Mr. Speaker. Go back and talk about their legacy, Mr. Speaker. They were importing power at the cost of $700 million a year, Mr. Speaker, and doing it at the same time when we actually saw our use increase 127 percent on coal, Mr. Speaker. We've actually shut down coal. When it comes to a legacy, we've got clean air, we've got a reliable system, and we're working on making this system more and more affordable. On that side Thank of you. the se se House, Mr. Speaker, no legacy. Thank you. Final supplementary. Once again, Speaker, we have a Minister of Energy ignoring the advice of the experts in the energy sector for his own political spin, his own political messaging. If any other company or business sold their excess product at a loss of $1.25 billion, you know what would happen to them, Speaker? They'd be fired. They'd be out of a job immediately. There's no way they would keep their job. Yet this government has the audacity to tell everyone how great they are. Mr. Speaker, everybody can see through this. They've made a mockery of our energy sector. Mr. Speaker, this waste in the system deserves an apology. So, Speaker, will the Premier apologize for signing energy contracts that we don't need and selling energy at a loss for up to $1.25 billion at the same time? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, let's look at the facts. The facts are, and they still matter in Ontario, $236 million in net benefit to Ontario ratepayers, which, Mr. Speaker, since 2013 have been a net benefit of our exports of over $1 billion in savings to Ontario ratepayers. Let's talk about our trade with our electricity system, Mr. Speaker. It's managed by the experts, by our system experts, Mr. Speaker, our system operator. And it's the market that determines the price of electricity. And we only export electricity when the trade is a benefit to Ontario ratepayers. Our government, Mr. Speaker, will continue to participate in the electricity market, increasing the reliability and the cost effectiveness of our system, Mr. Speaker. Yes, it is something that we'll continue to do and something, Mr. Speaker, will continue to work with all of our partners, all of our neighbours, all of our system Thank operators you. and the experts to make sure we have the best. Thank you. New question? The member from London West. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, this Liberal government said students who decide to withdraw from college because of the strike will receive a full tuition refund. This has created confusion for students about whether they have to withdraw from college completely or just from the semester. Students have lives outside of class. They may work full-time. They may have kids. They need to know whether getting a tuition refund and restarting the semester in January is an option. Speaker can this government assure college students that they can withdraw from the semester, get a full tuition refund, and be guaranteed a fresh start in January? Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Well, uh, thank you, Speaker. And uh, uh, throughout the strike, I have spent time talking to student leaders, talking to students, understanding what issues they were facing. And the getting a tuition refund speaker was an important priority for students. And that's why I was very pleased to announce that students who withdraw as a result of the strike are entitled to a tuition refund speaker. This is, um, I, 
I think that's fair. In fact, it goes above and beyond uh, what many considered to be fair, Speaker. To answer the, uh, the member opposite's question, if students, this applies to students who withdraw. Uh, they, of course, can come back. Not every college program has a January uh, re-entry speaker, so it will depend on the program and the college. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. For a student going to college anywhere in Ontario, but especially in Toronto, a $500 hardship rebate doesn't even cover a month's rent. Add rent onto additional childcare costs, lost hours of work, textbooks that may barely be used, penalties for cancelling flights home, and the many other. The Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation is warned. Finish, please. And the many other out-of-pocket expenses that students have incurred in over the last five weeks, and $500 becomes more of a joke than a solution for some students. Speaker, why is this premier not offering effective help for Ontario college students? Okay, Minister. Well, Speaker, I, I have to say this is a rather bizarre question coming from a party that rejected every opportunity to get students back to school more quickly. In fact, that's the party speaker who said if they had been in power, the strike would go on as long as it took. Speaker. So that's pretty, a pretty bizarre question to now be concerned about students' expenses when last week, Speaker, they were not concerned about students one little bit. Right. Yeah. Final supplementary. Speaker, $500 is not nearly enough to compensate students for what they have lost during the five-week strike. And for some, cramming five weeks of missed content into two weeks is just not possible. Imagine a busy working mom going to college part-time to get a better life, balancing kids and a nine-to-five job. She hardly had enough time for coursework before the five-week strike, and now, with the holidays approaching, the Premier is asking her to find even more time time to cram five weeks of learning into two. Instead of creating more confusion and chaos for students, why isn't this Liberal government offering a program that actually responds to the financial hardships, the personal realities and the emotional stress that students have experienced over the last five weeks? Thank you. Minister. Well, Speaker, I absolutely acknowledge the stress that students have been uh, experiencing, were, were experiencing during the stress and will continue. We are very happy students are back at work today, and we are stepping up to support them as they do complete their semester. So, Speaker, we have established, we have every college has established a dedicated fund right. to support students for additional costs that they incur as a result. Of the, uh, of the strike speaker for many students. Those courses will go into January. There will be additional costs borne by students, and this fund has been established. In certain circumstances, colleges have discretion to grant more than that. Speaker, in addition, students currently receiving OSAP will be, uh, OSAP will be extended to help them uh, if the course goes longer, if the program goes longer yes, into January, Speaker. And thirdly, we very much want to support students to complete their semester, but those who choose to withdraw will have a full tuition refund. Thank you. New question. You're from London West. Again to the Premier. Speaker, despite her minister's assertions, it is the Premier's inaction that prolonged this strike for five weeks. Last night, she told students who were angry that she did not get involved sooner, that she was acting on advice that she was given. Well, I'm not sure where the Premier gets her advice, but Sections 4 and 5 of the Colleges of, the Colleges of Applied Arts and Technology Act give the Premier every right to involve herself in college business if it's in the public interest. Maybe the Premier can tell us what was it about a five-week strike coming to a fair resolution that wasn't in the public interest. Advanced education and skills development. Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Well, Speaker, it's it's interesting that the NDP is continuing to uh, refer to that section of legislation. 
What they have failed to understand is there is another piece of legislation, Speaker, that overrides that, that does not allow government to interfere with the collective bargaining process. Finish, please. So, Speaker, once it became clear that the parties could not uh, reach an agreement, that they were at a deadlock, Speaker, we did commit to act. We used every opportunity to quickly pass legislation that would, uh, that would get students back in the classroom. But the NDP blocked it every single time they had the opportunity. On Thursday, we, introduced, uh, we sought unanimous consent to introduce legislation that was denied by the NDP. On Friday, we introduced legislation Answer. and then required unanimous consent to debate the legislation the same day. Again, the NDP blocked the motion over and Thank over. You. They repeatedly. <laughs> Thank you. Su supplementary. Speaker, the Premier also told students last night that she will be looking into whether or not she had the authority to intervene earlier. Let me spell this out for the Premier. Section 4 of the Colleges of Applied Arts and Technology Act allows the Minister to make binding directives to Ontario colleges as to how they conduct their affairs. Section 5 of the Act allows the Minister to intervene in the affairs of colleges if it's deemed to be in the public interest. I find it hard to believe believe that neither the Premier nor her minister knew that they had this authority. Why didn't the Premier exercise her legislated authority and direct the colleges not to force a contract vote that everyone knew they would lose, unnecessarily prolonging this strike for as much as two weeks? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Well, S Speaker, as I said earlier, uh, there is overriding legislation. We uh, have very solid legal advice, Speaker, that the, the order would have been challenged had we moved to back-to-work legislation too early. But let's be really clear what this is all about. The NDP are hearing from people that they are not happy that the NDP blocked the legislation, and they are Finish, please. So, Speaker, I will finish up by saying that the College Collective Bargaining Act does not equal the College of Applied Arts and Technology Act. Speaker, there are two pieces of legislation. The NDP should be aware of that, and they should understand we pushed it as hard as we Thank could. Thank you. We'll Speaker, last night at the Premier's town hall, students were upset. Some were in tears as they described the effect that this five-week strike has had on their learning. Instead of comforting these students, the Premier defended her decision not to intervene. She said, I had an understanding of what my authority was, and I— Stop the clock. Member from Trinity Spadina is warned. You may finish. She said she had an understanding of what my authority was, and I acted in good faith on that. Speaker, these are empty words for a young person in tears trying to figure out how to recover from five weeks of uncertainty. Again, Speaker, I ask, why did the Premier not use her legislative authority to order the colleges to reduce the number of precariously employed faculty early in negotiations, thereby removing one of the most significant issues that led to the strike in the first place. Well, Speaker, I can tell you that no one, no Premier ever in the history of this province has cared more about Premier than our Premier Kathleen Wynne. It is thanks to this Premier that one half of college students have free tuition. 210,000 students can say thank you to this Premier for ensuring they have free tuition. Speaker. We are committed to students we are committed to equity of access to post-secondary education for people across the province. Speaker, we have 50,000 more students applying for OSAP this year than last year, thanks to this premier. Yeah, yeah. And her for students. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. New question: The member from Whitby, Oshawa. 
Speaker, my question is for the Premier. After the Liberal government allowed the college strike to drag on for five weeks, 500,000 community college students are finally returning to their classrooms today. Yesterday, I asked the Premier if the Liberal government would commit to matching the college student support fund dollar for dollar. As expected, the Premier did not provide an answer. Speaker, because the Premier failed to show leadership for five weeks during the strike, 500,000 college students at the very least deserve a concrete answer. Will the government commit today to matching the college student support fund dollar for a dollar. Yes or no? Thank you. Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Well, Speaker, um, of course we all understand that the PC's uh, uh, protection of collective bargaining is uh, weak, to say the least, and uh, we uh, we let the process play out, Speaker. We uh, we engaged ourselves as we could to try to find a resolution. One of those things is. We're setting up a task force speaker to look at some of the big issues facing the future of our colleges. But we have really listened to the voice of students, and I want to say thank you to the students who took the time to work with government to, to identify issues that students were facing and to help us develop those solutions. So let me repeat, Speaker, we have got a dedicated fund for hardship. And we, the colleges have discretion to go above the $500 cap in exceptional circumstances. Students who choose to withdraw a speaker will have their tuition refunded if they choose to, to withdraw as a result of the strike. And in addition, speaker, students who are on OSAP yes, will sir. be able to get additional support if the semester goes along. Thank you. Final su uh, supplement. Speaker, back to the Premier. For five weeks, the Premier let the strike drag on. Students weren't in class and were put through unmeasurable financial stress. Some speaker forced to sell their personal belongings to make ends meet. It's time, Speaker. It's time, Speaker, for the Liberal government to finally stand up for students and take tangible action to address their financial hardships. Speaker, will the Premier do the right thing today? and commit to matching the $500 for student support fund dollar for dollar. You see it, please? You see it, please? Minister. Um, speaker, I'm, I'm happy to see that the, uh, the PCs are standing up for students, but I have to ask the question, where were they when we made the changes to OSAP Member from Niagara West Glanbrook is warned. Finish, please. Speaker, where were the PCs when we made the changes to OSAP that uh, expand access to people from all income groups in this province? Where were they when we found a way to get free tuition to 210,000 students? The sad reality, Speaker, is that they have. They voted against it. They voted against it. They weren't there for students. They weren't there for changes to OSAP that have made Ontario a leader, an international leader in student financial assistance. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. We're, we're a very eager and energetic group here, Speaker, as you're well aware. Speaker. To the Premier, yesterday I was listening to the Minister of Energy respond to questions about Hydro One's two rate increase applications. The Minister praised Hydro One for finding savings, but Hydro One is not passing any savings on to ratepayers by decreasing rates. Instead, Hydro One wants a 20 per cent distribution rate increase. The Minister said Hydro One is doing a great job as a company, even though Hydro One is currently taking the Ontario Energy Board to court in order to keep 100 per cent of a $2.6 billion tax break that rightly belongs to ratepayers. Why does the Minister think his job is to praise Hydro One and not to defend the interests of ratepayers? 
Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We were very pleased to bring forward the Fair Hydro Plan, which actually defended ratepayers by reducing their bills by 25 percent, and that member and that party voted against it, Mr. Speaker. Oh, so it's this party, this party, Mr. Speaker, that is actually defending ratepayers. It's this party that's actually working with companies, Mr. Speaker, working with companies to make sure that we can continue to find ways to reduce bills for ratepayers, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to Hydro One, they've seen their bills in R2 and R1 designations, Mr. Speaker, drop by 40 to 50 percent. And it had nothing to do with that party, Mr. Speaker. It had nothing to do with that member. It had to do with, Mr. Speaker, the company, the government, and ratepayers all working together to come up with solutions, Mr. Speaker. That's what we have done on this side. On that side, Mr. Speaker, they've done nothing. They have a plan that is Sir. high in the sky that didn't even talk about helping low-income individuals, Mr. Speaker, and that is something that we have Thank done you. with all organizations to help all ratepayers in this country. Thank problem. you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. The Minister of Energy cheered when Hydro One applied to buy a Vista, even though this $6.7 billion purchase will do nothing to improve service for Ontario ratepayers. This purchase will divert resources away from improving the reliability of the grid towards the cost of building an empire for Hydro One. The Ontario Energy Board said Hydro One was making poor use of its existing funds for capital improvements and told it to reduce its revenue requirements. Hydro One basically refused. The privatized Hydro One is putting private profits ahead of the public interest. Will the minister stop cheerleading for Hydro One and start protecting the interests of Ontario families and ratepayers? Again, Mr. Speaker, it's this party that actually protected ratepayers by bringing forward the Fair Hydro Plan. It's that party that voted against ratepayers by making sure that they didn't support the plan, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to Hydro One, the acquisition uh, of a Vista benefits customers, employees, shareholders and ratepayers, Mr. Speaker, and it's important to say rates will not be impacted. It won't even affect local jobs either, Mr. Speaker. Similar acquisitions are increasingly common, Mr. Speaker. Fortis purchased uh, Michigan Base ITC, and Epcor purchased two U.S. water utilities. When it comes to making sure, Mr. Speaker, that the, the government is on the side of the ratepayers. It's this Premier, Mr. Speaker, it's this government that will continue to work with our, our, our stakeholders, will continue to work with the OEB, will continue to work with the ISO to have a clean, Answer. reliable and affordable system, unlike the opposition parties that have no plan to do that, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Northumberland, Quincy West. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is also to the Minister of Energy. Minister, in my writing, I often hear from constituents on the work of this uh, government on the energy file. The constituents in my writing know how critical a clean and reliable energy system is to Ontario, being a great place to live and work. Refurbishing at the Darlington and Bruce nuclear generating station will ensure that we have affordable, reliable, clean energy for years to come. However, my constituents sometimes worry that the projects may go over the, over the set out budget and will be delayed. Today, the Financial Accountability Officer released a report about the province's refurbishing project. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please update the House and my constituents how the refurbishing project is going? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also want to thank the member for that question and, of course, question. for the hard work that he does each and every day for his constituents and his riding. Um, I also want to thank the uh, Financial Accountability Office uh, for providing their important analysis of the refurbishment project. Um, the FAO report confirms that our government has carefully considered the financial risks of nuclear refurbishments and has built in strong protections and oversights, uh, oversight measures Mr. Speaker, to prevent cost overruns. The FAO report also makes it clear that there is currently no alternative clean generation which could replace nuclear generation at a comparable cost for Ontario ratepayers. Additionally, the report notes that refurbishment is the most cost-effective, low-emissions generation Answer. source available to meet Ontario's baseload requirements. Mr. Speaker, I want to reassure the member and his constituents that the refurbishment of our nuclear fleet remains Thank on you. budget and on time. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Not only will the refurbishment of Ontario nuclear fleet ensure we have a safe 
re reliable, clean energy where and when we need it. It will also bring our province and our communities like mine in Northumberland Quinney West significant economic benefits. When it comes to providing a boost to the Ontario growing economy, the refurbishment of Bruce and Darlington will support Ontario globally recognized nuclear supply chain with more than 180 companies and 70,000 jobs across the province. This will have a significant positive impact in my riding of Northumberland Quinney West being just adjacent to Darlington. A few weeks ago, our government released a 2017 long-term long energy plan in which we recommitted to a major mandate letter objective, mainly refurbishing 10 nuclear Question. units in Ontario, both Darlington and Bruce. Minister, what measures are we taking to ensure this project remains on time and on budget? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In order to prevent cost or schedule overruns, our government has implemented strong protections and oversight measures, Mr. Speaker. Bruce Power has invested approximately $13 billion of its own funds and has agreed to take the full risk of cost overruns on refurbishment of their nuclear units. Uh, the Unit 2 refurbishment at Darlington is progressing very well and is on track to be completed on time and on budget. In any case, the government has established off-ramps that may be used in the event of OPG or Bruce Powers failing to adhere to the approved schedule and budget. We've been very clear, Mr. Speaker, that we will not proceed if there are significant cost or schedule overruns. While we continue to monitor the two other projects or these two projects, Mr. Speaker, nuclear power will continue will Answer. continue to be the backbone of the safe, clean, reliable, and affordable electricity system we've built here in Ontario. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question, the member from Melbourne, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, yesterday during committee, the member from Kitchener Centre announced that the drug for cystic fibrosis, or CAMBI, would be covered under OHIP+. Plus. Uh, even though there haven't been any negotiations for the drug at the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance in two years. Speaker, this government has members continue to make announcements about OHIP+, Plus, giving many hope for them that are suffering from rare diseases and cancer. Unfortunately, Speaker, those statements aren't always correct. Speaker, can the minister confirm right now if our Cambly would be covered under OHIP Plus, or did the member from Kitchener Centre mislead the committee? Here. Excuse me. The member will withdraw. Withdraw. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm uh, happy to stand up and talk about OHIP Plus, which I think all of us by now and most Ontarians understand that come January 1st, uh, every single Ontarian up to their 25th birthday, preceding their 25th birthday, will ha have access absolutely free of charge to more than 4,400 medications. Medications like insulin, Mr. Speaker. Medications like EpiPen. Medications for uh, puffers for those with asthma. Yes, cancer fantastic. drugs. In fact, I was with the Canadian Cancer Society yesterday, and I was with the the uh, the uh, um, committee, the organization for rare diseases, uh, CORD, Mr. Speaker, yesterday as well, uh, to talk about the availability for the first time free of charge cancer drugs for children and drugs for rare disease. Mr. Fantastic. Speaker, this is an incredible advancement and expansion of Medicare in this province, one yes, that I think we all should be very proud of. Yes. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again, there is no uh, direct answer to my question, but, Speaker, when you write policy on the back of a napkin, statements like those made from Kitchener centers that appear to happen. Either the government has no idea what will be covered under their plan, or they're promising drugs they know will not be covered in an effort to gain support. Speaker, will the minister stop stringing the people of Ontario along and admit right now that their back of the napkin OHIP Plus plan will cover nothing, nothing new, nothing more than what's covered for the seniors, nothing more than what's covered for the Trillium uh, uh, patients of Ontario. Well, Mr. Speaker, I hope what the member is not saying is that he opposes the biggest expansion of Medicare in this province's history since Medicare itself. 4,400 drugs will be available. So, so, and particularly you know given his professional background, Mr. Speaker, we're working with pharmacists, we're working with pharma companies. I'll accept that. 
We're working with important stakeholders like the Canadian Cancer Society, with pediatricians across this province, with those that have specialists in adolescent diseases and illnesses. 4,400 drugs available. You don't, there's no upfront payment, no co-payment, no annual deductible. All you need is your prescription and your health number, and 4,400 drugs will be available. If the member opposite can't support that, I'm deeply concerned about how he approaches health care in this province. Thank you. New question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. A report released last week by Children's Mental Health Ontario outlines the serious problems caused by wait lists of up to 18 months for mental health services for children and youth. The media reported that Shannon Nagy told her mother at five years old that she wanted to die. In grade six, she missed the entire school year. Now 20, Shannon says her struggle to get help throughout her childhood did more harm than good. Kim Moran, now the CEO of CMHO, had to take a four-month leave of absence, then work part-time when her 11-year-old daughter tried to die by suicide while waiting on a year-long list for help. When would the Liberal government finally act to significantly reduce wait lists? Mr. Children and Youth Services. Mr. Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to uh, thank the member for the, uh, the question. Um, mental health, when it comes to young people here in the province of Ontario, is a, a huge priority for this Premier, for this government, and the Minister of Health. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, a few years ago, uh, we invested $100 million into mental health here in the province of Ontario. And as we made that investment, we also started another process uh, called Moving on Mental Health. And what we've been, been able to accomplish over the last few years is, is quite remarkable. We're really th rethinking the entire system here in the province of Ontario. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we've set up uh, 31, almost uh, 32 of the 33 lead agencies um, across the province of Ontario to better coordinate services on the ground. And this is about system transformation. The same thing we've done in education, same thing we've done in health care, uh, the same thing we've done in the energy sector. This is a system transformation. And Mr. Speaker, um, I uh, assured yes, members that I met uh, last week uh, at the uh, conference that uh, we're looking for massive system change here. Here's supplementary. Speaker, the minister knows that everything that he just talked about did nothing to do anything to reduce the wait lists. Children's Mental Health Ontario has been saying for years that the underfunding of services are, put, are putting a huge strain on our hospitals because these kids have nothing else and they reach crisis situations. Last week's report shows the impact of an 18-month wait list have on education and on the ability of families to be able to continue to earn a living. A third of parents have had to miss um, have had their child miss school due to anxiety. A quarter have missed work to care for their child. The stress continues to mount up and adds to already very difficult situations. I ask again, when will this government act so that children with mental health problems can get the help they need when they need it? Thank you. The reason why we are looking for system change is to make sure that young people get the help when they need it. Uh, the member says that we're not doing anything to address the issue. I'll let the member know that as a province, we invest almost $4 billion into mental health. Almost half a billion of the, those dollars goes to help young people here in the province of Ontario. Currently in the province, Mr. Speaker, there's 130,000 young people getting services. The member says we've done nothing. Well, here's a few things that we've done in the last few years. We provided funding for mental health leaders in all 72 school boards, providing funding to hire additional 770 community mental health workers across the province of Ontario, 144 additional nurses working in schools to identify uh, students that need help, and more than 80 new mental health workers uh, and addiction workers working uh, in Indigenous communities. We've also expanded our online mental health directory. Mr. Speaker, we set up Bill 89 here in the province of Ontario with the Progressive Conservatives voted against to do exactly what we're doing, system Thank change. You. Thank you. The member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. November is Financial Literacy Month. 
Financial literacy is an important part of learning and living in the 21st century. Being financially liter literate ensures that we know what is happening with the finances in our homes so that we can plan for the future and weather any unexpected expenses. During this Financial Literacy Month, our government is taking action to ensure that students in Ontario can develop a solid foundation of financial literacy skills. This means having the knowledge to make informed financial decisions with confidence and care. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, how is our government revamping the curriculum to further the development of financial literacy skills in Ontario schools? Yeah. Thank you, Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. I'm pleased to rise uh, in the House today to recognize November as Financial Literacy Month, and this is a life skill that everyone can benefit from. Our government is committed to preparing students for success in a rapidly changing economy and technology-driven world. Earlier this November, I was at Parkdale Collegiate Institute in Toronto to announce that we are making financial literacy a mandatory part of the Grade 10 Careers course starting in September of 2018. We know that our young people are better off when they can understand basic money management, budgeting, or credit. Our plan for education is preparing Ontario students for the jobs of today and tomorrow. This is an important part of our plan to create jobs, grow the economy, and our renewed vision for education. We remain committed to achievement, equity, and well-being for all students in Ontario, including financial well-being. Thank you, Minister. Financial literacy is a skill that is vital to the success of our students. Our government is doing more to equip students with the skills they need to compete in an integrated global economy. We have never wavered in our commitment to student achievement. Just this year, we launched 29 pilot projects across the province to inform the recently announced enhancements to the Career Studies course. During the pilot projects, education partners participated in the process providing important input about new mandatory learning on financial literacy. Minister, can you tell us more about how the new and improved careers studies course will prepare grade 10 students with financial literacy skills? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Davenport for this very timely question. Students and teachers felt that the pilots were so successful that we will be expanding the new careers course to all schools across the province starting in 2018. We will be refreshing the careers course to include budgeting, so students can map out their pathways plan and then itemize its components to create a personal budget. Credit, so students can explore issues related to credit card debt and collaborate on suggested solutions for acceptable use. And OSAP, so students can use the new OSAP calculator tool to plan for post-secondary education. Mr. Speaker, Ontario students are among the top performers worldwide Thank in you. financial literacy education. But we are not stopping there, Mr. Speaker. Yes, We're making this a mandatory part of Ontario's curriculum. Them, we remain committed to investing in our most valuable resource, our Thank students. You. Your question, the member from Huron, Bruce. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, this weekend the Premier will be heading to Asia on a trip to China and Vietnam. It was in Vietnam where, under two weeks ago, the Prime Minister failed to show up at a meeting with 10 other world leaders and jeopardized Canada's position in the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations. Given how important the TPP will be for Canadian agriculture, including Ontario's grain farmers, has the Premier raised concerns with the Prime Minister over what has been interpreted by other TPP nations as a snub? at the APEC summit. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, on the second part of that question, I'm just to assure the member opposite that we are in regular communication with. We work very closely with our federal counterparts on all of the trade negotiations, Mr. Speaker, as we did on CETA, as we are doing on NAFTA, Mr. Speaker, and as we are doing on uh, on the TPP conversation. And as the member opposite will know, that none of those uh, provisions have been finalized, and we will continue to work very closely with the federal government. And I will say to the member opposite, I'm very uh, I'm very pleased to be able to take uh, about 100 companies with us, Mr. Speaker, wow. to China and to Vietnam, companies that want to, want to develop partnerships, Mr. Speaker, that will mean more jobs in Ontario, more investment in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, which will, again, continue to help our economy to grow. Thank you. 
Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Premier actually has totally lost the point of my question, and that is that TPP, I agree, presents a great opportunity for Ontario's agriculture sector to break into new markets. The Premier's government website advertises her upcoming trade mission directly and references Ontario's and Vietnam's participation in the TPP as a key business tie. So, Speaker, I have to ask the Premier, why is she not pushing back at the Prime Minister to get the TPP talks back on track so that Ontario farmers and agri-food businesses will not miss out on a tremendous market opportunity? Well, Mr. Speaker, the TPP talks are on track, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, we're we're very pleased that there was a, a preliminary uh, agreement in principle, Mr. Speaker, and we will work very closely with uh, with the federal government. And you know, Mr. Speaker, as we have done, as we are doing now in the NAFTA conversations, Mr. Speaker, I'm acutely aware of two things. First of all, the opportunities for markets and the expansion of markets. That's why I am traveling with companies to. China and to Vietnam, Mr. Speaker. I, it's why I'm, uh, I'm so engaged with businesses here to make sure that they understand what the opportunities are abroad, Mr. Speaker. But secondly, to make sure that in these trade negotiations, in these conversations, we protect our industries, Mr. Speaker, that we protect and stand up for workers here in Ontario and make sure that when there is a negotiation of a trade deal, yes, Ontario and Ontario's workers benefit. Please. 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 Thank you. New question. The member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the Premier. Sudbury has waited eight long years for a PET scanner. In December 2015, this government promised to change that. Our community raised the money. We did our work. We've done our part. Actually, the first PET scan in Sudbury should have been happening right now. But instead, we've learned that this government is holding up the process. It could be 2019 before PET scans are done in Sudbury. Why is this Premier letting us down again? Why is she delaying the PET scanner that we should have had eight long years ago? Thank you, Premier. Long-term care. Minister of Health, long-term care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I would like to uh, thank MPP, the MPP for Sudbury for his strong advocacy for both his community and for Northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Because, Mr. Speaker, it was his hard work that resulted in the government providing two sources of funding for the PET scanner. Mr. Speaker, we announced $1.6 million in annual operating costs for the PET scanner once it's fully operational, but that wasn't sufficient because we were, quite frankly, overwhelmed by the level of community support and the fundraising coming forward on the capital side, and we wanted to make sure that, that, capital, uh, those, that those capital improvements necessary for the PET scanner were able to proceed. And again, with the support and hard work from the MPP for Sudbury, yes, we sir. were able to make a substantial capital in the millions of dollars capital investment towards that purchase and towards the necessary capital improvements. Supplementary. Speaker. The good people of the Northeast have been calling for equity of access to PET scanning technology since 2009. The Sam Bruno family, Cheryl, Frank, Mary, Lori, Sam's mother, Rosina, a grieving family speaker that knew nothing about fundraising, went on and raised $4.1 million to purchase the scanner. Health Sciences North has done everything that they need to do, but today, my constituents still can get a PET scan done in Sudbury. We still have to drive five, six, seven, eight hours on icy roads to get the health care we need. Frankly, Speaker, we feel like this government never took that problem seriously. And now, news of more delay just add to the disappointment Question. toward this Premier and the, and the government. How can the Premier defend another year's of delay for us to get access to PET scanning Thank technology? You. Well, 
Mr. Speaker, again, thanks to the hard work of the local MPP, MPP from the MPP from Sudbury, Mr. Speaker, we have made the multi-million dollar capital investment, the operating funds as well. The PET scan, the people of Sudbury and the surrounding area will not have to wait much longer. We're working with the hospital, the, the Bruno family, the community supports that are in place. This project is on track and will open as expected, Mr. Speaker, and provide that important service so that hundreds of individuals from Sudbury and the surrounding region in the north will no longer have to travel to take, the pet, to, to, to take advantage of PET scan technology. And I want to again congratulate and thank the MPP for Sudbury yeah, yeah. for his excellent thank advocacy sir. and hard work for many years on this project. Thank you. New question, a member from Beaches East York. Thank you, Speaker, and my question is to the Minister of Research, Innovation and Science. Now, just last week, Speaker, I understand the Minister made a very significant announcement at a completely sold-out Canadian club event. Quite clearly, the people want to hear this PhD in physicist speak. That announcement was regarding the chief science file that he was tasked with in his mandate letter from the Premier. And I understand, Speaker, the objective was to create an office in a position that would be responsible for helping coordinate Ontario's significant science and research assets. The officer would advise the Premier and the Minister on key scientific matters and raise the profile of science in government policy. So, Speaker, could the Minister please inform the members of this House of his work on the Chief Scientist file? Question. Thank you, Minister of Research, Innovation and Science. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to begin by thanking the member for East York and Beaches, not only for his question, but also for his advocacy for science and research and innovation, a file which I am particularly proud of, Mr. Speaker. On November 17, Mr. Speaker, I was at the Canadian Club delivering a speech on the role of science in the formation of public policy, a subject I am quite passionate about. I was there that I was uh, able to announce the appointment of Dr. Molly Shoiket as Ontario's first chief scientist. Wow. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Dr. Shoiket is a professor at the University of Toronto and an internationally respected and award-winning expert in the study of polymers for drug delivery and tissue regeneration. Mr. Speaker, over the next month, Dr. Shoiket will help Ontario develop a strategic scientific research yes, agenda. Sir. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and um, I thank the Minister of Research and Science. His mandate was very clear, and he very clearly has fulfilled his mandate. And I too would like to offer my personal congratulations to Dr. Shoichet, and I'm extremely pleased and delighted with this bit of news. Because, Speaker, our government will now be placing much greater emphasis on science in the formations of all of its policy decisions. And I know it gives the residents of my riding of Beaches East York great peace of mind to know that this government will make responsible and well-reasoned decisions based on the advice of experts in their fields. So to the Minister, Speaker, could he tell the members of the Legislature what the responsibility of the Chief Scientist will be? Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, thank you to the member from East York and the Beaches. Mr. Speaker, part of Chief Scientist's responsibilities will be providing expert advice to government to help decision makers tackle some of the greatest challenges our time and our society are facing. Challenges like climate change, aging population, fighting deadly diseases, and the impact of transformative technologies. It is my pleasure to congratulate Dr. Molly Shoiket for becoming Ontario's first chief scientist. She will help us continue a proud tradition of science and research excellence through evidence-based decision-making. To all my colleagues at the House, please reach out to Dr. Shoiket and wish her well on her appointment. Answer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Life is getting harder for Ontario patients as they're waiting longer and longer for the care they need. The number of patients without a doctor continues to rise in my riding. Mm. Today, over 2,100 people are waitlisted for a doctor in Bruce Gray Owen Sound, a 62 per cent increase over last year. Not only is this a break of your election promise when Kathleen Wynne guaranteed all Ontarians access to doctors by 2015, 2018, sorry, but it's actually a deplorable record. Minister, I want to know, is matching in terms of the doctor going to be another Liberal stretch goal or yet another hollow promise? Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud that, uh, that 
95 per cent of Ontarians have access to a primary care provider, be that a family doctor or a nurse practitioner in one of our 25 a nurse practitioner-led clinics. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, since uh, we came into office, more than well over, uh, I wish I had the exact number, but well over 6,000 new physicians are practicing in this province. In fact, I believe we average between six and 800 new doctors uh, entering, net new doctors entering practice uh, each year in this province. That being said, there's no question that there are parts of the province where uh, we do not have an adequate supply of the relevant uh, health care providers, including our uh, frontline primary care providers and physicians, and we're working hard on that. We're working on that in a variety of ways with local municipalities. We're providing incentives and opportunities yes, for uh, physicians to open in the various types of uh, family health organizations and other modalities to uh, increase the use. Thank you. Speaker. Sup supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Minister of Health. With all due respect, Minister, you should not be proud until it's 100 per cent. Health care is fundamental to everybody. Sure. Patricia Russell Kaplan is among the 2,168 constituents who are on an ever-growing wait list for primary care physician in my riding. Patricia also suffers from amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, a fatal neurodegenerative disease, so her access to a doctor is absolutely critical. Yeah. I don't know how many years you would feel comfortable waiting if you were facing a similar predicament. So I ask through you, Mr. Speaker, Minister, what is fair about ALS patients like Patricia going two years without a doctor while you waste $4 billion on a hydro accounting scheme? Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's rich coming from a party that closed 10,000 hospital beds, closed more than two dozen hospitals, referred to our nurses as uh, hula hoops going out of fashion, out of style, Mr. Speaker. But we have increased in this province the ratio of physicians for every 10,000 Ontarians. It's increased from 17.5 physicians per 10,000 Ontarians to 20.5 physicians fantastic. per 10,000 Ontarians. And we have dramatically increased the percentage of Ontarians that have access to a family a doctor, a primary care provider, a nurse practitioner, and we're not done yet. We agree, 95% isn't sufficient. We're going to reach that point where every single Ontarian who wants a primary care provider, be that a doctor, be that a nurse practitioner, will have access to that individual. Keep on, keep on, and even more so, our patients first, first act spoke directly to this answer. issue to make sure that we would attain that goal, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. On a point of order, I'd like to uh, correct my record. In response to the uh, member from uh, Prince Edward Hastings, I said in relation to the PC's uh, imports uh, power, they spent $700 million on electricity costs. That was incorrect, Mr. Speaker. I meant to say $900 million in 2002 and 2003. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London, has given notice of his dissatisfaction of the answer to his question given by the Minister of Health Long-Term Care concerning coverage of Okamabi under uh, OHIP+. Plus. The matter will be discussed today at 6 p.m. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.